didn't know, and I really appreciate his heart. And uh, Josiah's that, that kind of guy that, that can, uh, you know, ruffle an atmosphere in about three seconds. And, uh, <laughs> if most of you guys know him, and he really has, has been used by the Lord to stir some things up inside of me. And I really think that there's going to be a deep stirring tonight from the Lord in regards to intercession as we hear his testimony. And then at the end, we're going to move into some time of prayer for the conference. So uh, please be attentive. I believe that the Lord wants to speak tonight. And uh, just from me, get ready for the weekend. And God's going to do a great work. Thank you. I try not to be too loud because I don't need this. How are we doing now? Good. I'm going to invite you to bow your head.
and there were like people right here, right here, and the pulpit was right here, and I couldn't get out from behind the pulpit, and, and I'm like, I've been licking my chops in a sense of, one, I love to preach the gospel and the message to, to God's people, but two, to preach at an atmosphere where people are really hungry for the Lord and they really do want to know Jesus, it's 20 times more fun. Right. It really is. So this is kind of like my ring, and I hope that I don't spit on you, elbow you, fly into you. I'm sorry if I'm doing a dance. I have been crying like a little boy all day long, and I've been crying because the Lord has been tenderly and lovingly reminding me of his loving kindness and his mercy to me every single day of my life. I want to just be transparent because I can before the Lord because I'm not ashamed anymore of who I am. And just say really briefly that um, I grew up in the church. My dad was a pastor. Um, I knew the Lord as a little kid. Uh, I was zealous for the Lord until I was like about 12 or 13 and then it's a long story, but but really from like 12 to 14, I just saw things and heard things and watched people that were Christians um, in the church do things and say things that I just didn't understand that offended my heart that ultimately uh, by the time I was 18, I in, in really in reserved places in my heart, I really began to hate God altogether because I thought that what I was seeing from Christians was a representation of who God was, which isn't the truth. And I'm not here to bash the church, and I do love the bride of Christ, and I love each person that's in this room, I, and I really do love anybody who names the name of Jesus, and even those who don't. But I'll just tell you that I was just seeing things through such a shattered, shattered lens. And um, by the time I was 18, um, my family situation had begun to change. We grew up in Indiana. Um, and we ended up moving to Lakeland. I signed on to go to Southeastern for my freshman semester of college. And I realized really quick that I honestly like didn't really know who the Lord was. Um, and I didn't really love Him. Not only that, but I felt more motivated in my life to be arrogant about how much I didn't know the Lord. And how much I didn't want to know Him. And it got to a point for me where I not only did not like the Lord or didn't love the Lord, but I began to entice others around me to not love the Lord, to not like the Lord, to not follow the Lord. And I really honestly took it upon myself in my rebellion and in my sin to begin to disciple people in the world. We talk, all, we talk about the Great Commission, Jesus, make disciples of all the nations, raise up sons and daughters, teach them about the faith, send them out to walk in the faith, perform the miracles, signs and wonders, love the people, do all the things. And while we're not doing that as a church, the world, the devil is raising up sons of the devil and daughters of the devil who want to disciple you, disciple your children, disciple your friends. They want everything that the Lord gave you for His glory to be used to glorify hell. It's true. And I can say that it's true and I shudder at the thought and that is why the mercy of the Lord is even that much sweeter for me. Because I not only didn't know the Lord, but I hated Him and I mocked Him and I arrogantly went after everyone who said they loved Him and told them they were stupid and told them they were foolish and told them that their investment in the Lord was a joke. And the Lord swooped in for His loving kindness and said, I don't love you any less for what you've done. I remember sitting on a couch when I was 21 years old living with my two cousins up in Indianapolis. I had left here. I had gone back. I was sitting I was sitting on a couch. I was on a three-day weekend from work. It was like Memorial Day weekend or something. I had been drinking for two days. I was on drugs. Um, I had been awake for like 56 hours or something. Some of you are like, well, I have no idea what that's like. Praise God for you. Um, I, don't, I would never wish it on anybody. Um, and I remember sitting there at like 4 in the morning on the third night of, of being awake for 60 hours. And when you're awake for 60 hours, your mind begins to play tricks on you. Things begin to go a little nutty and you begin to see things that you shouldn't be seeing. You begin to hear things that you shouldn't be hearing. And what I quickly realized was something in me was like, this is very bad. And you're beginning to entertain things that if you go very much further, you won't come back from this. And I'm sitting there and I'm, and I'm blown out of my mind and I'm sitting there with another beer and I'm sitting on the couch 
and, and the place that we lived, our dirty apartment, beer cans everywhere, drugs everywhere, people coming in and out of the house, purchasing dope, all these different things. Some of you guys are like, hey, like guys like this in the church? The Lord came for people like me. Come you. Come on. And I remember sitting there on the couch, and I just remember, and I didn't even know the Lord, and I didn't, honestly, nothing in me thought it was going to work, but I just said to the Lord, God, if you are real, I just need to hear you say my name one time. Lord, if you'll just say my name, I'll believe. I'll leave this junk today. I'll stop. And I waited not even five seconds. And I heard the audible voice of God in my living room. I saw light and the Lord said, Josiah. And then he said, I love you. And I remember putting down my beard and opening up my hands just with my charismatic expression that I had learned growing up. I didn't know what I was doing. And for the next two hours, I've, I've never even told anybody this story. I just, I sat there with the Lord and He just loved on me. And He told me about His faithfulness. And He told me about His mercy. And it was one of the first encounters that I had with the Lord over the next five years of my life. I'll be 26 in a couple weeks. The last five years of my life, again, being transparent, has just been me back and forth. Running and going and coming and back and forth. Lord saying, I want to be persuaded by your loving kindness. I want to be persuaded by the power of your love. But in the end, me really not wanting to change my lifestyle, me not really wanting to change my thinking, me not really wanting to change anything about what I was doing. I wanted to hold hands with the world, and I wanted to hold hands with God. But how many of you know that Jesus' name is jealousy? Jealous, jealousy, and that God is a consuming fire, and that when you come into contact with the holy person of Jesus Christ, that He doesn't come for part of you, He doesn't come for 75 or 99.9, He comes for 100% because He wants the whole thing, because you were made in His image for His glory, for fullness and satisfaction that goes far beyond anything this life could ever want for you to have. Do you know that everything in this life is after your heart? Everything, I just said it to Boomer before the service, I was reminding this old hymn. We're talking, I pray with him. Tis so sweet to, drop, to trust in Jesus. Some of us know the song. Many of us do. The world wants you to do everything but that one thing. Come on. I've been feeling in my spirit and my heart for weeks. 2 Corinthians 4, 16-18. Therefore, do not lose heart. Therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed day by day. These momentary and light afflictions are achieving for you an eternal weight of glory. So fix your eyes on that which is seen, but that which is unseen. For that which is seen is temporary and fading and burning and dying and doesn't last. And that which is unseen is eternal. And you were made in the image of that which is eternal, beloved. How many of you know that we're going to live forever? We're going to live forever, but we're so bogged down by the things that don't matter. And I don't want to make light of life happens, disease comes, there is death, there is financial hardship. There are those times when you feel abandoned, even though you know in your mind and your heart that God will not abandon you because He's not a man that He should lie and His word is valid always. But we give into our emotions. How many of you know that the devil attacks our emotions in order to redirect our will? Like a puppet, he tries to play with us. And let me tell you what happens. Once we stop walking in the realm of that which is eternal, and we stop fixing our eyes on Jesus, who really is the author, the perfecter, and the finisher, and the finisher, and the finisher of our faith. And I emphasize the finish because he will finish everything that he started. He didn't die on the cross and then beat death, hell, in the grave three days later, only to leave us down here and never come back. No, no. 
As surely as I am alive and in the flesh in front of you today, Jesus Christ will split the sky. He will come back for His people because He loves us. You can make no mistake about it. If He's not, I quit now. If, all, if this life and these services is all that there is, I quit. What are you talking about, man? These services are so great. Yes, they are. But let me tell you, it's a drop. And it's not even a drop in the bucket in comparison to what's going on in Revelation 4 right now. Do you know that there is a very real throne and a very real king and a father and the Holy Spirit who are there standing on the sea of glass and the Holy Spirit lives out of the tomb? Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. There are four living creatures and 24 elders on 24 thrones who are casting down their crowns before the Lord with seven lamps of fire burning. The seraphim all around the celestial being seraphim literally means burning ones. And all of the saints who have already gone on before us standing on the sea of glass, nailing, I don't even know what they're doing. If I was there, I'd probably just be bawling and crying and completely undone. But all they're saying is, holy, holy, holy. Yeah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is now and who is to come. come they have been persuaded and convinced of the reality that there is nothing greater than the blood of Jesus and the power Ooh. of His love. It's more than convincing. You ever told somebody that you, that you love them to death? Jesus made that pledge to the world, to the cross, on the cross, and he meant it. He went to the grave and he beat it. Oh, come on! <laughs> Some of you guys are like, this guy's not. Yeah. I may be. If I'm out of my mind, it's for Christ. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but really, do we realize that Jesus, who was totally in perfect love and bliss and romance with the Father who was in heaven came to earth because we needed a Savior and He walked obedient to the Father in the flesh for 33 and a half years and then Jesus who is was fully man still is fully man and fully God and you know what they try to they try to minimize or water down the work of what Jesus did by saying, yeah, he was fully man, but, you know, he was also fully God, so it really wasn't that. No. We don't understand that Jesus went to the cross. He was mocked. He was beaten. He was bruised for our transgressions. He was humiliated worse than anyone in this room has ever been humiliated. Then he hung on a cross, and this is where our supernatural eyes, the, the spirit of wisdom and revelation is opening up the eyes of our heart right now to understand and know that it wasn't just the physical pain of being on a cross and having the nails in the hands and on the feet and the crown of thorns on the head and the sinner on the cross, the thief on the cross, mocking him and saying, what a joke, to which he said, No, he said nothing because the other thief was like, you're an idiot. <laughs> this man who is perfect, who's never sinned in his life, who's God, is dying for you while you're dying, and you still have a shot. That was me. I was dying on, on that cross next to the Lord, deserving what I was about to get, and Jesus looked at me and said, you wouldn't mock me if you really knew who I was and you really knew how much I loved you. Right, and it's because of you that I'm hanging on this cross. Well, yeah, you can say that, but it's implied, beloved. Hanging on the cross, three nails in, do you realize and do you know that at any moment he could have got off? He's God. He could have said, enough of this, you all die. I'm done. I'm going back to the Father. But it was for love. Purchase this traitor's heart right here. All of us, traitors. Right. Traitors. Deserving death. Deserving eternal separation from the eternity of love. Oh, I mean, beloved, you're like, yeah, I've heard the gospel or whatever. 
And I honestly, beloved, I can preach the same message every time. It would never get on to me because I really have just spent the last year of my life being convinced and persuaded every day over and over and over again of how awesome this man of love, who is love, really is. He doesn't give love. He is love. He doesn't reveal truth. He is truth. He doesn't give mercy. He is mercy. Do you realize that Jesus, the King of the nations, is going to come back and that all of the nations of the earth are going to stand before Him? Every knee will bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now try to wrap your mind around the fact that in that, in the fullness of His power, in the fullness of His authority, the fullness of His zeal, that He will still be in the fullness of mercy, the fullness of humility, We're so not like Him on so many levels. So many levels we can't comprehend until the Lord comes and He does something on the inside of us. It changes us completely. God doesn't fix us. We, we become new creations in His presence. And the power of love is the most potent thing because it's eternal. just bear physical pain. He took on the weight of the sins of you and I and the other billions upon billions upon billions of people that have ever lived and took it on in one meeting of death. Honestly, think about how many times in your own life where you have been overwhelmed by your own sin and your own shame and you can't bear the weight of it. And Jesus Christ took yours and mine, everyone in this room and everyone who has ever lived and will live and beat it in one day. Yes. The power of Jesus, the power of His blood. You ever heard the expression that blood is thicker than water? You know, something's going on, family, friends, whatever. It's like, yeah, I cheese my family because blood's thicker than water. Right, Alvin? Blood's thicker than water. Not thicker than the blood of Jesus. Blood. He's saying that to us. There is nothing thicker than my blood. Just going to talk briefly. We're supposed to talk about the, the glory of intercession. <laughs> An invitation to intimacy, a call to action. Just because I'm saying it, or because he says it, or because he says it, or because anyone else says it, figure it out for yourself. You and the Holy Spirit. The cross. It's the greatest act of intercession the world has ever known. And I really believe that in the church, in the charismatic church, in different churches, in the, we, we have minimalized intercession to on our knees praying, crying out, groaning, weeping, willing. And again, I'm not minimizing that stuff because I do it. I love it. I was born to pray. I love prayer and I love intercession. But there's a part two. God is raising up a new breed of intercessors. And that part two is the action that has to come after. Yes. How many times will you get down and pray for the same person or the same situation and nothing happens until you finally realize that the Father has got His hand extended to you and said, You be the deliverer. You go to them. You speak the truth to them. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> God, would you raise up a deliverer to preach the gospel to my family? To my lost brother who's hooked on drugs? Yes, I will. Now go give him a hug and tell him that I love him. Lord, I'd rather just stay in my prayer closet and pray because that's a spiritual thing to do. You can keep praying prayers in your prayer closet and doing nothing while the world dies and goes to hell. And that may sound super harsh and it may sound so offensive. 
but the, re it's the, the reality of it is truth. I was living in Kansas City about, it was, just, it was about three years ago, and I got a phone call one night at about 10.30 at night, and this phone call was from somebody I didn't even know, and they said, hey, are you friends with this girl? Yes, I am. Well, let me tell you what I heard through the grapevine is going on in her life. What was going on in her life was in the beach of North Carolina, at Wilmington Beach. From Kansas City to Wilmington is over a thousand miles one way. Okay? They basically, in, in like 15 minutes, described to me one of the most horrifying things I've ever heard of in my life in terms of that. When I knew this girl, she, the shoes that are on my feet right now, she bought me these shoes. First prayer meeting I ever really participated in was because of her and my brother. And then I get a phone call and somebody says, hey, this is what's happened. I'm sorry for the rattling around. Are you want me to need to fix it? Point it up. Whatever you want. Point it up? Yeah. Oh, how's that? Praise God. <laughs> Carolina, 
We get there to her family, her mom and dad, who never met us. They met Blair, they knew about me and they knew about Blake, but we never met face to face. Her mom meets me at the door, she falls down crying, thank God that you've come. Oh, thank God, and I'm thinking in my mind, no one knows where she is. How are we going to find her? Even the Lord said, I'll give her to you. I'm still in my mind, like, you know, you're right, like, what, I mean, how? I'm just going to drive up and down the coast of North Carolina and, and knock on every motel door and say, excuse me, now, have you seen this little five foot two blonde girl who used to love the Lord, but she's become totally deranged by demons? <laughs> and she's with a man who's about 16, is covered in, in dirt. And I honestly, I thought in my mind, I was like, man, this guy must be a really good looking dude. Because Sarah is a, is a pretty girl and she really loves the Lord. And I know some of the guys she dated before, so I don't even understand this. Well, that was one of the ugliest looking dudes I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I dumped that on my head. It's water, by the way, in my marathon cut. Okay, so we get there, go to the door. My mom's crying. Oh, uh, we're there 30 minutes. Phone rings. Somebody calls her mom and says, I had a dream. And in the dream, I saw three people traveling across the country. And the Lord said that he's going to tell them where she is. And surely as the Lord lives, your daughter will be delivered within two days. I'm like, at this point, like, well, that's a good start. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, dude, I did some crazy stuff out in the world and now I'm driving halfway across the country with no money to go look for somebody just because I love them and I, and I believe in the call that God placed on their life and their infinite value to the Lord. I did it for love. Because I really did love her as, as my friend and my sister in the Lord. So we go anyway. So her dad's the chief of police, right? For the first day that we're there, we're riding around like every town. We're riding around in his unmarked cop car. He's doing like a hundred miles an hour down every side street talking about when he finds this guy, he's going to empty the clip in him, and when you do, you better call the cops and pray for his soul, because I'm going to murder him. And I'm just like, oh my God, I came here to watch this guy die. <laughs> I'm thinking, I came out here for the love of God, and I'm about to witness one of the most horrific murders in the history of North Carolina. And me and Blake are literally looking at each other, and this is like, the guy was a, quite a bit smaller than me, and a little shorter than Blake, and I'm thinking in my mind, I'm like looking at him, and he's got his gun on him, he's got a shotgun in the rack, I'm like, dude, I'm not going to die for this guy, I mean, I'm not going to step in the way and take a bullet for the guy, I mean, forget about it. So anyway, night one, day one, all these different leads still know Sarah, don't know where he, don't know where they are, don't know what's going on, but we're praying all day, praying. So we spend the night in this beach house they had for a family. And we like take take us to this beach house on Wilmington Beach. The most like one of the most epic beach views I've ever seen. I slept that night with the second door storm doors open with a 60 degree breeze blowing in the sound of the ocean. And I was just like, what if I can draw me out for this? <laughs> <laughs> At the time I wasn't married, so I was like, you know, I think it would be better for to just be a beautiful wife. <laughs> he heard my cry. He just said, <laughs> so we wake up the next morning and honestly the second morning I was discouraged Blake and Blair were really discouraged and at that moment everything was just like why did you come out here and this isn't going to work her mom had gone to complete hysteric despair I'm never going to see my daughter again She's going to die. She's going to, I mean, and it was like, I mean, life seemed as if it was falling apart all around me. Really, it did. And I just remember stopping and saying to the Lord, I know that you're going to show me your faithfulness. Because you said that you're going to. I know that you really are as loving and as kind as you said that you are. Because I'm alive and I'm 
here in North Carolina. We get a phone call. A friend of a friend of a friend who is having lunch in a town that was two hours from where Megan lived, who was visiting friends, saw who she thought was Sarah and called her parents because she knew that she was missing and said, hey, I think this is her. Okay, well, let's go. So we drive two hours. Get to this hotel where she's at. Well, the, well we drive up. There's five hotels in a row. Big hotels on the beach. I'm like, oh, man, I'm going I'm to spend the rest of the next five hours going door to door. Because at that point, I was like, this is what, what we've got to do. It may not get any better or any more detailed than this. I obviously didn't understand how great and detailed the Lord is. Because the Lord, through prayer, revealed to us the exact hotel and the exact room within 15 minutes. Was it luck? I didn't pick one. We drive and we pray. We pull up. I see her going into the room with the guy. Okay, now, now the moment of truth. What do you do? <laughs> Sarah, I'm here to take you back to your parents. God loves you. And sir, step off. <laughs> this is my friend. I mean, honestly, I was, I was wrestling with my flesh because I didn't know whether I was going to open the door and I just was going to pump the dude and grab Sarah and we were going to leave. Or, you know, what do you do? I mean, the weapons are a warfare, not carnal. I can't jack the dude in the face and then just say, well, God loves you. And it doesn't work that way. I knock on the door. This guy comes to the door. His teeth are falling out. He's smoking a cigarette. He's double fisting 16 ounce beers. He smells like hell. And I literally mean, like, if hell had a stench, this is what it would smell like. The demonic presence coming off of him gave me an instant headache. Literally, just, ugh, I had to step back. I stood at the, and in the background, I can see her sitting on the bed with her head in her hands. And immediately I knew she was under the influence of the devil. Literally. So in my mind, and I'm literally just like, oh, I don't know what to do. And again, I'm struggling. Like, I could have easily, I could have dealt with that guy physically very quickly and gone and got her. She didn't want to go. Talked to him for an hour. He finally lets her come to the door. He wasn't holding her against her will. She kept saying, I want, I want to be here with him. He really loves me. All the way I'm like, this is so demonic. It's so deceptive. It's so... Unreal, it doesn't make any sense. This, I mean, on any level, I mean, what what in the world? I remember I got angry. I went into the parking lot and I was like, what the heck is going on here? This is not right. Jeremiah preached a message two weeks ago on frustration. He said it very briefly. He didn't really go into it because he stayed on course with his messages because he's way better at that than I am. Frustration is a holy invitation from the Lord to intercession. What if we look at every frustrating sequence, scenario, and circumstance in life as an opportunity to be more intimate with the one by which we were made for His glory? And we called upon His name and gave Him the rightful opportunity that He's really longing for to show us His power and His glory. Good. But instead, as Jeremiah preached, we let our hearts become possessed by rage, by anger, by anxiety, by fear. We get in the flesh. We gaze temporally. We let this thing that is knocking on our door, that is threatening us, take hold of our lives. Once you go from gazing eternally to temporally, it can be a very slippery slope, very downhill, very fast. Because what happens next is that the devil comes and stands in front of you and he begins to question the identity of God. Yes. God's not really faithful. He doesn't really love you. That's why this is happening. And that's when you got to push emotions to the side and step into what's going on in the sea of glass and say, that's real and that's not. Come on. That's reality and this is not. Come on. The nations are going to war. 9-11, Iraq, Haiti, Afghanistan, Japan, New Orleans. One natural disaster, war and tragedy after another. And guess what? God is still sitting on the throne. Amen. Completely in control. The day of 
his return engraved upon his mind. Once you let the enemy come and question from the Lord as you begin to buy in to lies about who God is, then it's easy to start believing who you're not. And acting like who you're not. We forget that we're no longer orphans. We forget that our daddy paid the ultimate price by sending his son for us. Talk with Sarah. She doesn't want to leave the hotel room. I'm frustrated. Oh my Lord, I came all this way. They confessed to us, her and this guy. Called me. Sarah Nettie Hay. And by the way, we are going to the courthouse tomorrow to get married. And we're not telling you where we're going. And we're not telling you which course out of all this different stuff. And I and I and I just was just so like what I mean, I honestly was just so I felt so helpless. My like, Lord, I can do nothing. Do you know that the Lord can do a lot with a little? But that He can do everything with nothing. Full surrender or partial surrender? My life has been a testimony of what happens when you surrender to God. Bad things happen. Don't really mean that. I'm quite, and I mean that 100% of the way. You know that Saul got the kingdom torn from him and passed by because of his 99.9? When the Lord told him to kill everything, wipe out everything, I don't want offerings, I don't want sacrifices, I, I just want obedience out of love. Saul kept the best and then offered them to the Lord in the Lord's name. Thinking he had done a great thing, and the Lord says, no, you've done it all wrong because you didn't do the one thing that I told you to do. It's dangerous. Second night, we go back to the house. The next morning, I'm thinking, okay, we're going to go home. She's gone. Nothing's going to happen. Get a phone call again. Hey, the guy dropped her off at her brother's apartment. She's with her family now. But she's totally delusional. She quit her, her job as a school teacher, as a Christian school teacher, teaching elementary students. And she still wants to leave and go back to the guy when she came back to get her stuff. We were going to leave. I didn't know what to do. I felt like the Lord just said, go to the apartment. We need to talk to her one more time. The guy's not there now. So we go to the apartment, knock on the door. Another hour of conversation. Nothing is happening. Nothing is changing. My words and my flesh and my strength are gone, and I've got nothing. The Lord said, I want you to hug her, and I don't want you to let go. And I'm like, <laughs> I've got nothing left. And I pulled her into my chest. I held on to her. 30 seconds. A minute. Two minutes. Three minutes. Five minutes. No words. She just begins to cry on my chest. And after about five minutes, I just started telling her how much the Lord loved her how much none of what she had done was separating her from him and that he longed to forgive her. Ten minutes later, she was in the car driving back to Kansas City with us. She's a, she's a leader in the house of prayer in Kansas City now. Totally devoted to the Lord. Totally devoted to discipling and raising up young women, young wounded women who have been to hell and back. To, only to see them walk with the Lord. Why did I tell that story? Because of the second part of intercession that I mentioned earlier. Jesus could have just prayed from the throne for each and every one of us and just... But it required 
him to move right. upon his own prayers. Upon, take action and say, I will stand in the gap for those who cannot stand in the gap for themselves. I will be the deliverer of men's souls. And I believe with all of my heart that in this room, on these campuses, in this church, in this city, that God is raising up intercessors. He's raising up deliverers who understand the importance of partnering action with what they pray. God, end poverty in the nations. God, save the starving kids in Africa. You go feed them. Lord, rescue women that are stuck in human trafficking that are being raped 15 to 30 times a day at 11 and 12 years old. You go hug them. You go love them. You cry out for them. Do you realize you were, this is our right as sons and daughters to move and walk in the liberty and the freedom that was paid for us on the cross? And we waste it with so many other worldly pleasures. Facebook, TV, parties, nonsense, 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 and more nonsense. Mindless conversations that don't mean anything in the grand scheme of eternity. Because again, if this is reality, then this is really all that matters. And all this other stuff that we do, it's a test. It's a trial. Not that you're on trial, but beloved, we need to know. And I'm going to land the plane. I think I need to probably. That we're going to give an account to the Lord for everything that we do and everything that we say and every minute of our time that we spent doing this or waste doing that. I have this whole like glorious message about David and Goliath and that whole thing with intercession, which I'll say for a little time. But I've just been feeling all week in my heart that God really does want to display His splendor and His majesty and power. He wants to blow our minds yeah. with the reality of what He is like, what He does. Come on. I believe that the Lord is looking for generations, plural, of people who will buy into the truth of who He is and what He is like. Your revelation of God and who He is will directly affect the way that you pray. If He is your Father, He is your Daddy, He is your Abba, He is your caretaker, your provider, you're dependent on Him, then when you come to Him in prayer, you will pray to Him in that way. You will petition Him and ask Him for things that you know that He wants to give you because you know His nature. But if you, if you don't believe that God is good and you don't believe that He's capable of being your Father, then you will come to Him like an orphan and you will beg for scraps from a table that you were made to sit at. I say with all the humility and mercy of my heart, having been an orphan for many years in my own right, still learning how to be a son before the Father. Always learning, Lord. Papa, just teach me how to be a son. The Lord says, I'll teach you how to be a father. All those years we all have been praying prayers. Oh, God. I need five dollars for lunch today. Lord, so if you would just forgive me, Lord, for all of my sin and, and just all of the bad thoughts that I've had this week, Lord, and just keep, I'm, I just keep praying, trying to justify to the Lord why He wants to give me five dollars. When the Lord says, I'll give you five million, just ask. And again, I'm not getting into this whole prosperity and intercession as an invitation to endless financial prosperity so that we can be lazy. That's not what I'm saying. And again, money is not bad. Good things are not bad. Having nice things is not bad. Loving your materials and your possessions more than you treasure Jesus Christ is horrible. So then you learn how to pray the prayers of sons. 
where if I don't have the money for lunch, I come to the Lord and I say, Father, you know that I am hungry today. And I would like to eat. So if you could provide a means by which I could have some money to eat lunch, I would be grateful. Yes. The answer is yes before you ask. It's about how you ask him. And it doesn't mean that he rejects our little orphan prayers and says, you're just an orphan, get out of here. The spirit of adoption that is being released from the heart of the Father is not kicking the orphans out of the church. It's adopting them. He's adopting us as his sons and daughters. I was an orphan. Now I am a son. Learning every day how to be one. And our mentality as sons and daughters before the Father in the church is that when the orphans come in and they need help, we want to kick them out because the church has become some exclusive club for the self-righteous. The shoe fits where? I'm not here to offend you for the sake of offending you. Jesus is offensive in and of himself plenty enough. I'm simply saying that what would we do if the homosexuals and the homeless... And the, and the, and the demon-possessed and the drug addicts came to the service tonight and they confessed their sins and said they needed to know the love of God. What would you do? Praise God? Or would you take a couple steps farther away from them and warn your family and friends that you need to be careful when you're in that section of the church because I think that this guy's got some serious issues. Real sons... Real intercessors never forget about their own barrenness outside of the Lord. I am what I am by the grace of God, not by any other means. One story, and then I'm, I'm going to end. And uh, what we're going to do when I'm done, by the way, is we're going to go back into a time of worship, but it's going to be a time of intercession. And we're going to pray for the conference this weekend. And for the city of Lakeland. And we're going to pray like sons to the Father. That He would raise up sons and daughters. That He would release healing, restoration, and reconciliation in the church. That He would raise up evangelists who will go after the souls of men and women in the streets. And proclaim and demonstrate the love of Christ to them. We're going to pray that God would break the power of the religious spirit of the church by praying that He would release His love and His mercy and His affection for us in a very tangible and manifest way. I don't know if I'm dying to pray like that, bro. Well, do you want to move heaven and see souls saved and see people get free, or do you want to keep muttering worthless tongues to the Lord that don't do anything? Amen. And I really mean that. Not, not in a harsh way. I'm not saying, well, you all need to learn how to pray, beloved. My journey to intercession has been so long. And I am still on the journey, learning how to pray every day. But asking the Holy Spirit, teach me how to pray today, Lord. Well, it's really easy, Josiah. Pray what I pray and do what I do and say what I say. And if you don't do anything else, then I can do what it is that I've said that I would do. But the minute you step outside and you start praying your own fleshly prayers, your own orphan prayers, then, you know, I'm kind of... God cannot do... Let me, let me say this. God will not do our part, and we cannot do His. He's inviting us to pray like Him and be like Him. How many of us want to be like Jesus? Do you realize that one of the greatest marks of those who want to be like Jesus is intercession? He is our faithful and merciful high priest and intercessor. You want to be like Jesus? Learn how to intercede and stand in the gap for others. Because that's what He does. That's what He did. That's what He's like. Amen. This is my story. It's a lot shorter story. You know, that we'll pray and in this time of intercession and worship. But I hope that a lot of you guys can stay. If you need to go and I'm done, that's okay. But we really just want to take a little bit of time and lift up the Lord and lift up this conference and ask the Lord to release freedom for the captives from the religious system that is weasel its way into the church and to release wake up the sons and daughters of God. There was a great atheist. I shouldn't even say great. I guess it's infamous or whatever. There's no really such thing as a great atheist. That's just 
Why you would, it takes more faith to believe that God is not real than it does to believe that He's not. Does that make sense? It takes more faith to believe that God is dead or not real or not alive than it does to believe that He is. There's a, this atheist is traveling around to all these universities, all these secular speaking venues, and he, he, he is telling everybody at every event and every venue, if God is real, then let him strike me dead. And if he doesn't kill me in five minutes, then God is dead and God is not alive and God is not real. And you can stop believing in your pathetic God because God's not alive. And it's a lie. And you guys are all pathetic for your faith. One after another, he would go. Nothing would happen. People would, all these Christians would gather and leave disappointed. <laughs> Well, I guess God's not real. You didn't kill that guy. So finally the atheist goes to another meeting. If God doesn't kill me in five minutes, God's not real. Five minutes. Moron's still alive. Does anybody here still believe in God now? Little lady in the back says, I do. He says, why? Because all that you've done is display for all of us how unlimited the patience and mercy of God really is. That was me. That was all of us. You may have not done that exact thing, but you were dead in your transgressions separated from the Lord. And because of the most faithful and glorious act of intercession the world has and ever will know, you are sitting in this room, alive and well, heart pumping full of blood, longing and living for the Lord to come again. Amen. Amen. I'm going to pray. Um, I hope that what was said tonight honored the Lord and you guys are stirred in your faith to spend your life in a, in the, in a, in life, intercession is a lifestyle, beloved. It's not a call just to pray here and there. Intercession is consistently going to the Lord in prayer. Intercession is about dependence upon the Lord. Complete dependence upon Him. Understanding that it's not about you and that it is about Him. And longing for others to encounter the same love that you yourself have encountered. Amen. Chris and uh, Jamie, God's going to come up. They're going to play, I'm going to pray, and I just want to invite you guys, we're going to worship, um, and then we're going to, uh, we're going to have a mic down here, and um, if you have a prayer uh, on your heart that you want to pray for the conference, like 15 to 30 second prayer, asking God to do something specifically to you, believing for what He's going to do, whether it's corporate or specific for family and friends, we want to pray for the city, pray for the conference, pray for the church, come up, and I want to encourage you, and again, what? It's all good. If you, well, I don't really know how to. It's okay. Just come up and pray whatever the Lord's place on your heart. The Lord listens and moves at the sound of our voice. Would you stand?
and our minds and our hands to you tonight, Father. I just lift up each person in this room, Father, and I thank you for the day of salvation. I thank you for the day of deliverance. God, I thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness and your mercy, Lord, to each one of us. Lord, I thank you that your love for us is stronger than death, more jealous and more demanding than the grave. Father, I pray that tonight you would set your seal of love upon our hearts and upon our arms. Lord, that you would release the spirit of intercession in this room tonight. Lord, we respond to the call to stand in the gap and cry out. Lord, for those who cannot cry out for themselves. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the act of intercession on the cross. Lord, thank you that you are not dead and that your body is not in the grave, but that you are alive and that you are in heaven at the right hand of the Father, living to intercede so that we might know you more deeply. And so, God, I just lift up this weekend and this conference to you. I lift up the city of Lakeland. And tonight, God, I ask that you would release a revelation of the love of Jesus, Lord, in this city. Lord, that you would break the power of the religious spirit. And that you would release love, Lord, that, that binds up brokenness and releases healing. Father, I pray that you would raise up deliverers in the church. Lord, that you would raise up sons and daughters who will declare your word with power. Men and women who will be persuaded and convinced by the love of God. Father, I pray that you would release the spirit of intercession, God, that we would be awakened, Lord, to groan and to cry out and to call upon you. Lord, that we would be a people of worship in this hour who are bent on lifting you up consistently, Lord, believing in who you are, and you do what you say that you're going to do, because you're not a liar. And so, Father, we just lift up the conference, we lift up Corey and the team, Lord, we lift up the worship, we lift up Jeremiah as he goes to preach the word. Father, we pray the word of the Lord will run swiftly and quickly that every heart and every mind that is coming would be opened up and receive every word that you have to say. Lord, that freedom would win the day. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for the conference, what you're doing in this city. In Jesus' name. time of just prayer, and I just want to encourage you, even if you don't come up on the mic, just to take a couple minutes and engage the Lord and pray. Fix your eyes on the Lord and ask Him to move this weekend. That's what we want to do. You guys can fill in the middle again if you want to. They're going to continue to worship, and we're going to pray. So if you have a prayer that you want to pray, please come up and pray.